Hello everyone. Uh, this time around I've got another uh, entry in the uh, Things People Do Wrong When Writing Dialogue, uh, uh, I guess, series now. Uh, again, I put like more than two seconds of planning into this. I've got slides. Who knew? Anyway, uh, what I want to talk about this time around is um, what people often call ye olde English. And I have not misspelled anything on this slide. Uh, it's written exactly the way it is for a reason. So what is ye olde English? It's basically uh, an attempt to sound uh, more, I don't know, well, just more, uh, I guess. Um, uh, it gives it gives some gravitas or something to what's being said, or sound like it's old-fashioned or something like that. And when done correctly, it can certainly work for that. But first, let's deal with uh, a, the, an issue with ye oldie in the first place. Okay, first off, the, the Y in ye uh, is not actually a Y. It's actually standing in for an old letter that's not used anymore in English called thorn, which you can see from this slide looks kind of like um, a line sticking its tongue out at you. Uh, you know, a P with the bump in the middle. Um, and uh, oddly, uh, for thorn, the uppercase form is smaller than the lowercase form, which is kind of fun. Uh, now, what you're seeing on the slide here is modern orthography. So uh, this is not what thorn necessarily looked like uh, back in ye olde times. Uh, it looked a lot more like a Y back then, uh, but not exactly like a Y, but uh, it was about as close as they could get with uh, the printing presses and so on at the time, since the type for them was made in uh, uh, mainland Europe, I guess, um, and they didn't have uh, runic-based uh, um, uh, uh, script at all, so the uh, these letters that uh, were used, so the and, and thorn isn't the only one, uh, weren't actually available. Uh, and instead of having having them made, uh, they just did the they just substituted something that looked close. So really, uh, ye here is thorn e. Now thorn can be universally replaced with th in any old text. And as soon as you do that, you can see that really that ye thing there is the. And oldie, with the e on the end of old, is just an old uh, spelling uh, situation, which isn't done anymore. We don't put that redundant e on there. Uh, although if you think about it, we probably should, but we don't. Uh, so basically, ye olde English is more correctly pronounced the old English. Um, but here's the other thing. It's actually not old English. Uh, anyone uh, speaking modern English today, if, if we heard actual old English, we wouldn't be able to make heads or tails of it. It, it, it would be... Uh, it would potentially feel vaguely familiar, uh, potentially, uh, but it definitely isn't going to sound like what we expect English to sound like. Uh, there's been some substantial shifts in the vowels over the centuries, and there's been some really substantial changes in uh, grammar and, and so on. So uh, quite a lot is different, and there's some theories on that, but I'm not going to get into that here. Actually, what is meant by ye olde English is early modern English. Um, it, it's basically the these and thous uh, business. Uh, and so uh, 
you know, thou art and all of that business. I should note that uh, what most pe- where most people have been exposed to uh, thee and thou and so on is from Shakespearean plays, but they are not a good example to use for working out what uh, this uh, early modern English actually uh, should look like, because Shakespeare's plays are written in verse, and that's going to mess with the grammar and everything potentially just to get the meter and so on to line up right. Also, by Shakespeare's time, uh, the thee and thou stuff was already falling out of use and its actual usage had shifted. And uh, that means that uh, what you would see potentially from what uh, is written in Shakespeare's stuff is not a really good uh, representative example of how people might have spoken when they were using these types of uh, of phrasing. Um, Now, you'll note I've changed the uh, heading on the slide here to use thorn. Uh, I'm going to try and remember to call this early modern English uh, instead of uh, ye olde English because uh, every time someone says ye olde English, uh, I want to strangle them. Uh, Oh, I should mention that uh, the extra confusion comes because there really is a word ye, which basically means you. Uh, So uh, that further complicates things because there is a word ye, and when you start spelling the the same way, it gets really muddled up. Anyway, uh, this early modern English uh, commonly shows up when the translator convention is in operation. And actually, uh, I came on the notion of doing uh, this particular uh, installment uh, as part of originally my previous one on the translator convention, but the translator convention one with this part ran more than 90 minutes and that's just way too long. Uh, It's commonly used to mark uh, uh, the high speech or something like that. Uh, So, you know, where, um, uh, without having to uh, say in the text that someone's speaking the high speech or something like that. Uh, or it could be used to indicate someone speaking an archaic form of the same language. Uh, it can also add mood or gravitas to a dialogue or, or what have you. And the anachronistic speech could also be uh, uh, a way of indicating that someone speaking an archaic form of the language, but it doesn't necessarily mean they are. Uh, it could just be uh, they're, say, they're saying things that, uh, for whatever reason, don't make sense um, in a, uh, uh, the particular timing. And if you have a time travel story, that anachronistic speech could be from the future. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be archaic. Um, now, here's where things go bad. Uh, the use of it is not necessarily a problem, but it's often butchered horribly. Uh, or maybe it's usually butchered horribly. It, it depends on the uh, the sample set you have. Uh, you'll see some uh, really nasty things. So anyway, um, the pronouns are the big marker for this type of uh, early modern English. That's thou, thee, thy, and thine, which merc- which merc- work exactly like um, I, me, my, and mine. Okay. It works exactly the same way. They're used in exactly the same circumstances. It's second person singular, and it's not formal, okay? Uh, In the original setting, it's not formal. Uh, Formal usage would have used the more familiar you, and that's probably why we settled on just you instead of having, instead of keeping thou, and it also has some special verb conjugation forms. It's it's not it doesn't fit into the regular pattern that the rest of the uh, verb forms have. Uh, and it's uh, it's important that uh, that you know that. 
Now, there are some other uh, things uh, with early modern English and vocabulary and so on, but some of those depend more on setting than the actual uh, language itself. Now, for verbs, I was mentioning the special conjugation for the thou uh, uh, setup. Uh, verbs will take the est suffix with thou. Um, I have the E in parentheses here because depending on the specific ending of the base of the verb, uh, the E might disappear uh, just because uh, it might be impossible to pronounce or there might already be an E there or, or something like that. Uh, there is another variation in verbs in the early modern English, and that's in the third person, where we're familiar with them taking the S uh, uh, on them. So, uh, you know, uh, goes, sleeps, you see, with the, the S there, they actually used to take an F suffix. Um, and again, the E might not be there depending on the uh, root, but it, it usually would be. Uh, now, uh, so that would be things like um, goeth and sleepeth. And we don't do that anymore. Uh, we use the S sound, and that's probably just a regular uh, phonetic shift over time. Uh, now, here is the important thing for getting it right with your verbs. You should assume that Every single other verb form is exactly the same as standard modern forms, except if it's uh, one of the uh, irregular or archaic formations that, uh, that you've actually researched and discovered. Um, things like hast and hath for have are slightly irregular, although they do still follow the pattern somewhat. Uh, and it's important um, because modern English and early modern English are just not that different. Now, here's the thing that people do really wrong a lot of the time. Now, sometimes it's done in parody, so it's not so, such a big uh, issue. But uh, what, what I see a lot is writers will just go in, go in and add F or, and S to random words uh, to make it sound uh, archaic or something like that. And quite frankly, it just makes you, uh, the writer, look stupid. Or if it's a character doing it intentionally in the story, it makes the character look stupid. Uh, you just don't do this. Uh, this is the f easiest way you can mark yourself as an idiot uh, when you're writing this stuff. Uh, you, in particular, uh, if you feel like you need to add F or S to a noun or an adjective or an adverb, don't. You don't do that. It, it's just wrong. Okay? And the other thing you need to do is, is look up words that you feel like using. There are things like must needs and forsooth and verily uh, that people like to inject randomly. Make sure you use them correctly. Um, it's, uh, it's fine to use some form like this that's not, qu you know, not quite right if you establish that it's kind of a local way of talking or something like that. But don't go overboard on it and try to keep it as something simple so it doesn't annoy the hell out of everyone. Uh, but look up the words. They'll be in a decent dictionary, and certainly you'll be able to find them on the interwebs. Uh, and look them up and find out how they're supposed to be used. And don't trust any random website. Uh, don't trust any random examples. In particular, the Urban Dictionary and that sort of thing are not reliable sources for uh, word usage information. If you look carefully at a lot of the definitions, they are almost right, but they're almost certainly not right enough. But look them up. Make sure you're using them correctly. Uh, it's uh, really, that's an important thing. Now, here's the other thing. 
when in doubt about what to use, or what structure to use, what words to use, or whatever, use standard, standard modern language. Uh, things haven't changed that much from early modern English to current English. Uh, there might be some pronunciation differences, there might be a little bit of vocabulary differences, but the structure of the language has not changed that significantly. So, when in doubt, just write normally. Now, depending on your purpose for using archaic forms, modern words and vocabulary are fine. Uh, the eth and est suffixes uh, for verbs are, are regular and standard. You can use them on any verb, uh, even a verb that didn't exist until five years ago. Uh, it's fine if your modern or if your your characters in your your story are in a modern type environment with computers to talk about computers. Uh, use the word computer. It, it's perfectly fine. If in the setting they would have a word for it, then use the proper word for it. Don't go out of your way to come up with uh, cute circumlocutions that aren't necessary. Because remember, oftentimes when you're doing this, the translator convention's already in operation. So there, unless they happen to be characters from the 1600s or 1500s or 1400s, and they actually do speak like this and don't know what these things are, you should use the proper word because you're already translating for your readers anyway. Now, uh, another thing that is tempting, though it doesn't show up as often, is to use uh, archaic letters that just aren't used in modern writing. Uh, like I'm doing with the titles on these slides with Thorn. Um, you want to avoid using these uh, because your, your readers are not going to know what to do with a Thorn or a long S, which is what that uh, second one there is after the or. Um, it, you notice it looks a bit like an F. Um, so uh, you, there's a reason we don't use the long S, actually, and it's because it is easy to confuse with F. So, you know, don't use it. It's just, just bad. Uh, if you use letters that your readers are not likely to be familiar with for more than just really short excerpts or something like that, uh, you're you're just asking for trouble. And uh, in particular, with something like the uh, the long the long s, uh, you're going to tempt people to pronounce things like an f. So you'll get things like uh, someone looking at the. Uh, U.S. Constitution or Declaration of Independence, or whichever document it is, where they actually have used this, and they'll talk about congraph if they're just reading it, not realizing that those are actually S's. So, uh, avoiding uh, archaic letters uh, is a good idea. Also, here's uh, another thing. Uh, it's tempting, you know, looking at the pattern from old, in the uh, you can see in the uh, title of these slides is to randomly add extra e's or y's or whatever to to words but that doesn't make them any uh any more uh, archaic or what have you it just means that you can misspell words um so adding you know, so adding e's to the end of everything uh well, no, you don't need to do that. Or changing every Y to IE or something like that. Uh, you know, all it does is needlessly obscure what you're writing. So make life easy on your readers. Another really important thing is not to go around adding random diacritical marks. Um, you know, that can be used to make things look archaic or foreign. Uh, usually you'll see this with names, uh, which wouldn't normally be translated. So uh, people will do this. 
But some people seem to think that adding diacritical marks makes the text look archaic. And uh, th this is uh, somewhat unique to English, I think, because we don't have a lot of diacritical marks used on actual uh, proper spellings. Uh, and so it, it just, uh, people seem to think it looks foreign or whatever, and uh, they'll use that. But they won't put, into, put any thought into what the marks actually mean. And, and that's why you should just, don't just add them randomly. If you're going to use diacritical marks, make sure you know what they're being used for and what they're usually used for. So uh, basically, this... Uh, this early modern English is, uh, well, let, let's put it this way. Uh, it, using it is not necessarily a problem. Using it to excess might be uh, if it uh, obscures what you're trying to say. But it's perfectly fine to have characters talking with, uh, you know, things like uh, thou art an idiot or something like that. Uh, it's perfectly fine uh, to, to do that. But make sure you're using things correctly. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's uh, it's really bad to say uh, thou thou artest an idiotist or something like that. That just sounds stupid if you know what this stuff's supposed to sound like, and it sounds stupid even if you don't. So, don't do that. Uh, basically, my point is if you're writing dialogue, because this usually only shows up in dialogue, and it's not just written stuff where this shows up. It shows up in movies and television shows and radio shows and that sort of thing all the time as well. If you're going to do this, take the time to learn the proper grammar that goes with the forms that you're using. Uh, if you were to uh, use ba just the stuff that I've talked about here, You'll avoid most of the uh, pitfalls that you could trip on. Uh, there are some uh, irregular verb forms that I haven't talked about, uh, the, particularly with to be. But uh, you can look those up. Uh, otherwise, uh, just stick with plain, normal-looking English. Uh, there, you know, there, there. There's going to be a few uh, variances, uh, and it will depend on uh, on specific circumstances whether it makes sense to use them or not. But exercise some intelligence when you're doing that, and don't deliberately obscure things by doing this wrong. Uh, there are enough people out there that know what this early modern English is supposed to look like and how it's supposed to work. That if you do it wrong, they are going to they're going to know it. And it's going to jar them completely out of the story. Whereas if you did it right, the people that don't know how it's supposed to work won't notice. And the people that do know will go, ah, oh, okay, it's right. Or it's right enough. Cool, I can deal with it. So this really, uh, the advice here is do your research, I guess. Research how it's supposed to go together and do it right. Uh, it's it's not difficult to do this research these days. Uh, it's not like you need to spend hours and hours combing through, uh, I don't know, encyclopedias and uh, linguistic texts and things like that to figure out how it's supposed to be done right. Uh, the internet is full of good resources on this sort of thing. So look them up. Use the information at your fingertips and get it right. Oh, and that goes for any other uh, random thing you might want to do with dialogue, including dialectical marking by uh, misspelling words or something. Uh, you know, just be sensible with what you're doing and don't do it to the exclusion of being able to understand what's written. Anyway, uh, that's uh, almost certainly enough on the topic of uh, early modern English or ye olde English. And, uh, you know... There's not much more to say about it. It's not that big of a topic, as you can see here. Uh, sure, there's some details, but that's all they are, some minor details. Anyway, uh, 
And that's all uh, for this time. Uh, if you want to be notified of future videos, make sure to subscribe. And if you've watched this far, thanks for watching.